Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land in which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I can come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give me, of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. This is the word of the Lord. Do you remember that day when you first moved out of your parents' home? Maybe some of you are waiting on that day still, and I'll be praying for you as you're living in your mother's basement. Uh, but I remember the day quite well. I packed up my 88 Ford Ranger, and I moved all of three miles to my local college. I went to college in my hometown, and so I moved all of my stuff out of the Ranger and into my dorm room and my local college. And then I went home for dinner that evening, and then that weekend I brought my laundry home, and my mother washed my clothes for me. A few years later, I moved to Louisville, Kentucky, where I did my seminary work, and that was a much more substantial move. We had to load up multiple vehicles and drive all of the possessions that, you know, a young 23-year-old uh, man might have that fit in two SUVs, uh, so it wasn't very much. And... We moved me into my dorm room. My mother took me out to eat steak and bought me some new leather shoes, and so she blessed me, and then she drove back home to Mississippi where I grew up. And then I had to figure life out. For the first time in my entire life, I didn't know where I was going to go to church. I didn't know anybody that lived near me. I had no friends. I was figuring life out. I had to figure out who I was in many ways. I was moving out of the shadow of my parents. Many of you can remember these days quite clearly, and some of you are living through them currently. Today we find our protagonist, if you can call him that, he's kind of an anti-hero throughout a lot of uh, Genesis, but we find our protagonist, Jacob, going through this exact same scenario. He's moving out of his parents' home, and he's hitting hard times. He's left his, his home and his family, and if you remember, he didn't leave on the best of conditions, as we looked at last week. This is a new beginning for Jacob. He's making his way out into the world. And so what I want to look at is his, this story. I think it's a powerful story that many of us can relate with through three different acts. And the first act of this story is leaving home. The second act is experiencing God. And the third act is committing for life. Leaving home, experiencing God, committing for life. First, leaving home. Verse 10 of this passage that we just read. I skipped the first 10 verses in between these two because it was kind of a repeat of many things and it talked about Esau marry, getting married. Uh, it, it wasn't as important to the story flow as verse 10. That's where we're picking up this week. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. Now Beersheba is where Jacob had grown up. And Jacob grew up in relative wealth. He grew up in a family that had been blessed by the Lord. He had many servants. He had some really nice tents to live in. He was living in relative luxury. There were many people that supported his family's estate in that way. 
And now he is all on his own, trying to make his way in life. And if you remember from last week, or just from the biblical story, that he's not leaving on the best of terms. Because what happened last week, but he cheated his brother out of his blessing, and he made everybody mad. He just wrecked the entire family. He's just a wrecking ball going through there. This is not the son that you're going to be proud of all the time, but he's going in there, and he's pretending like he's Esau. He's stealing Esau's inheritance and his blessing. Now his dad is dead, and his mom has to send him away because her other son, Esau, wants to kill her favorite son, Jacob. This family is in shambles. And so Jacob is on the run. He's a fugitive. Esau wants to kill him. And he's left the comfort and wealth of home, and he's trying to figure out his life and paving his own way. And where is he going but Haran? Now, Haran is where his mother is from. It's where Rebecca is from. And if you go really far back in the story, it's actually where Abraham's from. It's where he lived before he, got, before he moved to this promised land that God had had told him. So in many ways, Jacob is undoing what Abraham has done. He is the promised child. God has called Abraham to go into the promised land, and now Jacob is having to flee the promised land and to go back to where Abraham was originally called. Verse 11, And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Now, it says that Jacob came to a certain place. And if you're like me and you're reading this, you think, you have this mental image, and the narrator puts it like this, and this must be what it felt like for Jacob, but you come to this certain place, and it feels like it's out in the middle of nowhere, right? He's using a rock for a pillow. He he has to be out in the middle of nowhere. But later on in this passage, what do we learn? But that he's in a city. He's in a city called Luz. But to him, it was just some random place. And he's so destitute. He's he's really hit rock bottom here in in many different ways, figurative and literal, that he can't even find anybody to take him in to their home for an evening in this great city of Luz. And so what does he do? He's just in some random place, a certain place, nowhere important. It's just a mere stop on his way to his final destination. It's a flyover state. He just decides to sleep outside and to use a rock for a pillow. He's just left home, and he's already homeless. He doesn't know, he doesn't have anywhere to go. It's a parent's worst nightmare to send your child out and their first night to be without anywhere. You hope that your kids can build on what you've already given them, build on the foundation, and be able to be more successful than you in all the different kinds of ways. And if Rebecca knew where her baby Jacob was sleeping, she would probably come and get him and bring him home and, and just stand in front of him before Esau could get him. This is a parent's nightmare. Maybe you feel like you're just in one of these random places of life right now. Maybe Boston isn't your final destination, but it's just a stop on the way to wherever you're going. And you're just in a certain place. There's nothing important going to happen here. Nothing important going to happen this week. You're just in a job that's a holdover job until you can get the job you really want. You're just in a certain spot. And what we learn is that God can meet you even in that random place. That many times the random places that God has for us in our lives are actually the right place for us to be at that moment and that he has something important for us in that certain spot. Look what happens next. Jacob encounters God. He sees this vision in his dream. And you know, we we wish we could give this, this is something about Jacob is, to this point, we're not sure that he's ever encountered God. Jacob has to leave home before he can encounter God himself. We can't force our children, those of us who are parents, we cannot force our children to experience God. Though we want them to, many times our children just have to do that on their own. They have to figure that out. The Lord has to send them out. They have to leave home before they really encounter who God is. 
You see, Jacob thinks he's in a random spot, but God had a plan for Jacob. If you look at the certain place that he's in, Jacob later calls it Bethel, which means the house of God. That's not a hard Hebrew word to translate. I'll just help you a second. Beth means house. El means God. So it's the house of God. That's an easy one. This random certain place becomes the house of God. And the pillow that currently represents his destitution comes to represent the presence of the Lord. Could it be that for you? That the certain spot that you are in could come to represent so much more than what you imagine. So that's leaving home. The second point that we have today, second act in the story is experiencing God. Because what happens next is amazing. Up until this point in the story, Isaac's relationship with God is shaky at the best. We don't see, or Jacob's uh, relationship with the Lord is shaky at the best. We don't see Jacob talking with the Lord whatsoever. He's never spoken a word to the Lord that's been recorded until this passage. He grew up in a home that taught the ways of the Lord, Yahweh, God. That's, that's God's name given to his promised people throughout the Old Testament is Yahweh. And we see Isaac owning that name, but we don't see Jacob owning it. The only time we see Jacob actually use the name Yahweh, he's dressed up as Esau, and he's lying. And Isaac says, he comes in with Isaac's favorite food, and Isaac says, how were you so successful in finding my favorite food and getting it cooked so quickly, my son Esau? And Jacob says, the Lord your God gave me success. Now notice, he didn't even say the Lord our God. He said, the Lord, your God. At this point in the story, we have no indication that Jacob has owned the Lord Yahweh as his own God. He grew up in a home that feared Yahweh, but he himself has not necessarily owned it for himself. I think that what follows is Jacob's conversion story, where he owns his faith for the first time. And it goes to show you that you can grow up in a family where you where your family teaches you all the right stuff and still not have faith for yourself. Verse 12, and he dreamed, and behold. All right, now this passage uses that word behold a lot. You guys say behold. Now, when it says behold, that's ancient talk for, yo, check this out, all right? So, and he dreamed, and check this out, so it's basically supposed to be like, this is a little bit of a surprise what happens next. And then it's like a surprise on top of a surprise. So, and he dreamed, and check this out, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of the ladder reached to heaven. And check this out, the angels of God were ascending and descending, and check this out, the Lord stood on top of the ladder. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. What a bizarre scene, too, to have a dream like this, where he sees a ladder, or it might be more like a staircase. We're not sure exactly what it looked like. And the angels are going up and down the ladder. And this ladder, it represents something. It represents the meeting place between God and the earth. More than that, it represents the meeting place between a holy God and sinful people. When was the last time we saw a ladder kind of like this? If we think through Genesis, we've already seen one kind of like this. All the way back, Genesis chapter 10, Babel, or was it 11? I get them confused. It's around there. Babel. And what's happening there? But the people are trying to build a ladder or a staircase to God. And God, he comes down. He has to come down to see their staircase to God. It's actually kind of hilarious that God, they think they're going to build a staircase all the way up to the heavens, but God has to come down just to see the, the tiny thing. And so it's to show us that we can't build our own way to the Lord. And here's why. Because when God comes down and confuses their languages, he's basically saying, look, I already got a ladder. You don't need to build a ladder. I've already got one. And he has a name. Because in John chapter 1, we see Jesus say this really crazy thing. And unless you're a student of the Old Testament, you're not going to catch this. But the person he's speaking to definitely caught it whenever he said it. Check this out. Behold, John chapter 1. 
just turn there. I'm going to read a little bit. Turn, if you have your Bibles open, John chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We're, we're starting in verse 43. Check this out. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. So what's Jesus doing? He's gathering his first disciples. He's going around telling people, hey, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And now Philip found Nathanael, and he said, we have found him, of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come from Nazareth? Skeptical. Philip said to him, come and see it. Come and see him. And so Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, behold, check this out, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Nathanael thinks highly of himself, does he not? I am an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Jesus answered him, behold, Philip, Behold, Philip called you when you were under the fig tree. I saw you. Before, sorry, before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree. I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered him this, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than this. And he said to him this, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Sometimes people read the New Testament and they say, Jesus never really claimed to be God. And it's because they've never read the Old Testament. This is no doubt Jesus claiming. He's not denying that he's the King of Israel. He's not denying that he's the Son of God. And he's also claiming To a true Israelite, someone who knows his Old Testament, he's claiming to be Jacob's ladder. I am the staircase. I am the meeting place between God and sinful man. The angels, they ascend and descend upon me. And in this moment, as these angels are ascending and descending, what we know about angels from the New New Testament and throughout the Bible is that these are the messengers of God. And so in that moment, there's this ladder where the angels are coming up and down. And these are messengers and caretakers for Jacob. You see, Jacob was in just some certain place, but God was watching over Jacob. And in fact, he had a whole league of angels taking care of him, going up and down the the staircase. God was active behind the scenes when Jacob thought he was destitute and by himself. God was with him in that certain place in the middle of nowhere. God appears to Jacob and he speaks. From the top of the ladder, the Lord speaks and he said, I am the Lord, the God, this is verse 13, back in Genesis chapter 28, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like dust on, of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and your offspring shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, I want you to remember just for a moment what's, what's happening in this story, okay? Because this, this promise, it can feel just rote. It can feel like something we've read a lot before because we have. And it cannot be that valuable or important to us. But then when you think about where we are in the story, Jacob's on the run. He, he's a fugitive. He's done some pretty bad stuff recently. And what do you expect God to say to him? If God were to appear to you as you're running because you stole someone else's inheritance and you've wrecked your family and you're just a deceiver and not someone that's particularly likable, what do you expect God to say to you in that moment? Maybe, well, Jacob, you've really done it now. You've gotten yourself into this mess. You've got to get yourself out of this mess. Get up off that rock and keep going and pull yourself up and make it happen. I expect better out of you, Jacob. No. 
That's not what he says, though. That is what you expect, but that's not what he says. What does he say? He just reaffirms the promise of grace and kindness. Way more than Jacob deserves. Way more than Jacob deserves. And that's the whole point of the story of Jacob, is we're supposed to look at someone who's not a particularly good person and see that God loves people who aren't particularly good people. Because that's who we are. Instead, God just gives him grace. But God doesn't just promise this far-off promise of that one day he'll inherit the land. That is true. But God also promises to help him right then in that moment. Verse 15, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Jacob thought he was all alone, but then God appeared And he gave him that promise that is the greatest promise that we have in the scripture, which is, I will be with you. I've got three young children, and I know that there's no greater promise for my kids than I will be with you. If they're scared, if there's anything that's going on, all I have to say is I'll do it with you. And then they're like, okay. Like, they could face any fear. Even if I'm terrified, if I just said, hey, I'll be with you, they would feel safe. That promise that we have from God, I will be with you, that helps us in our moments of anxiety. It helps us in our moments of weakness. Who can stand against us when God is with us? What shall we fear when God is with us? With the Lord by my side, I know I'm going to be all right. And so God revealed himself to Jacob. And how does Jacob respond? This is, this is great. I love, I love his response. This is the perfect response in this moment. Verse 16, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not even know it. <laughs> How many of us ha- can say this and have said this, that the Lord has appeared to us in a place when we were not expecting. The Lord is in this place. Friends, wherever you are, are you in a certain place right now? The Lord is in this place, and I did not even know it. He's got so much going on for you. He is there. And then, verse 17, it, it continues, and he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Now, I want you to look at this for a second, okay, because this is confusing. When you get to this in the Bible, it's oftentimes confusing because it says Jacob was afraid, And then the words that he uses after it says that he was afraid do not match the emotion that we think of when we think fear. Because he says, how awesome is this place? This is the house of God. But yet he's afraid. And the Bible talks about the fear of God all the time. All the time. And when you get to that, I don't know what you think of. It's a a weird thing to, to think about. And it's something that's difficult for many people to understand of why The Bible can talk about the fear of God in a way that sounds positive because there is a way to fear God that is like real, I'm terrified of God. And that is the appropriate response to God if you don't have Jesus, if you haven't been made right in your sin, if you're rebelling against him, terror is not an inappropriate response to him because he is great and he is mighty. But then oftentimes the scripture doesn't, like here, when Jacob says, it says he's afraid, but then it doesn't seem like he's afraid of God. It just seems like he has the fear of the Lord. He fears the Lord. So what does it mean to fear the Lord? Here's a definition, okay? Hang with me on this definition, all right? If you're taking notes, you can write it down. I'll read it once or twice, and then we'll unpack this for a second. What does the fear of the Lord mean? Michael Reeves defines it like this. He says, true fear of God is... True love for God defined. It is the right response to God's full-orbed revelation of himself and all his grace and glory. The fear of God is true love for God defined. It is the right response to God's full-orbed revelation of himself and all his grace and glory. The fear of the Lord is synonymous with True love for God is the right response to God's full-orbed revelation. Every time someone encounters God in the scripture, it's a 
it, it's almost always a positive thing, and it's almost always described as saying fear, that they feared the Lord. And why would they use the word fear? Because the f- word fear here, it's really equated with love, but love doesn't really express it the way that we want it to. Respect and awe, they're too weak. Respect just isn't quite, quite right there. Awe is closer, but it doesn't capture the intensity, the thrill, the delight of encountering God. The word fear is the best word that we have for it, but we have to unfold that word fear and think about the full implications of what it means for us. Because our God is not one that delights to make us feel terrified of him like an abusive father on another one of his drinking binges. Our Father is one that wants us to delight in the enormity of his grace and of his glory. Our God is one that wants us to delight in the enormity of his grace and his glory. And the only way that we can respond to that is through some words like fear and trembling. It is so mighty, so great, that it makes you feel fear and trembling. There are very few times in my life that I can point to an experience that I had that wasn't with the Lord that resembled this, but I can think of two. And and they both just are things that were just beyond me in comprehension, walking up to Niagara Falls, I felt a fear. And it was like, this is amazing. I'm not afraid of jumping in it. I'm not afraid of dying. It's just, whoa, the rush of that moment. And then the other one was the Grand Canyon. And it's just, whoa, this thing is massive. It's, It's an overwhelming feeling. And this is how it's described as people encounter the grace of the Lord. Check out these few verses. Nehemiah chapter 1. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. You see that? They delight to fear the name of the Lord. Isn't that crazy? That they delight in fear. There's some crazies that like, that delight in scary movies, but that's not what this is. This is people who delight to fear the name of the Lord. Psalm 112, the man who fears the Lord is the one who greatly delights in his commandments. The man who fears the Lord is the one who greatly delights in his commandments. Psalm 147, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. The fear of the Lord is to enjoy and to delight in God. It's an enjoyment so intense that it leads to trembling. It's so, he, God is so overwhelmingly kind and magnificent that we were left with no better word than fear to describe the feelings that we have with him. And this is the moment where we see Jacob giving his life to the Lord. He's encountered the full glory and grace of God. He understands who God is for the first time And he owns Yahweh as his own Lord. Church, maybe you're in the spot where you want to encounter God like this. And you wish that he would give you a vision like he gave Jacob. You know, if God would just appear to me, if I could just have this religious experience like what Jacob had. Then I would give my whole life to the Lord. And what I would challenge you with is this, that you have something better than Jacob. Because Jacob had this ladder, and so he got this image of who Jesus is, but we have the person of Jesus who's come, uh, God has come as a man. He's shown us who he is. It's been well documented and recorded. He sent his Holy Spirit so that we would continue to know him, and we have to look no farther than Jesus to see the actual ladder. You don't need the the vision that that Jacob had. You need Christ. And you have to go to him over and over again. You read his word. You learn of him. And you seek to follow him. And this is better than what he had. We, we had. We have it here. You can't drum up an experience that can compare with the sweet moments of trusting Jesus as the Lord at a certain nowhere place. The last point and the shortest one. Uh, is this. We, we've gone through leaving home, experiencing God, and last one, we see him committing for life. 
After Jacob has this genuine experience with God, we see Jacob commit himself to God. Verse 18. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he, had poured under, that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. The stone that once represented this, this lonely place that all he could find was a stone for a pillow now represents the meeting place of God. Verse 19, he called the name of the place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in all the ways I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I can come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God and this stone which I've set up for a pillar shall be God's house. Okay, let me comment on this for a minute. Jacob's a piece of work, okay? (laughs) Jacob does not know how, how to make a commitment without making a bargain, okay? So he's coming to God, and he's like a, a classic type three on the Enneagram. He's mastered the art of the deal here, okay? He's like, look, uh, okay, okay, okay. If you give me everything, you'll be my God. So, like, he's like, I got to be the man, all right? That's basically what's happening here. Like, I'm still in charge here, God, but if you'll do this thing for me, then, yeah, you can be my God. He's a piece of work. He's a messed up dude. But at the end of it, he, he says, that Yahweh will be my God. What went from Yahweh your God gave me favor is now Yahweh my God. He owns this God. He isn't living off the fumes of his parents' faith anymore. And he owns this God as his own God. He's making this vow. And then verse 22, 23, 22. And this stone which I've set up for you for a pillar shall be God's house, and all that you give me, I will give a full tent to you. He's committing himself, not just in heart belief and head belief, but he's saying, hey, for you to be my God, that means you own everything. <laughs> that everything belongs to you, and I'll give you a full tent. He's, he's committing to this tithe to God. Martin Luther once said this, he said, there are three conversions necessary for the Christian life. The conversion of the mind, the conversion of the heart, and the conversion of the purse, or your wallet. And that's so true for many of us. Many of us can live where we believe in who God is in a mental kind of way, and that's honestly the first step for for almost everyone, that they have to have this plausibility structure that Jesus could be who he said he was, that he actually was a man who lived and 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 died and was resurrected, and he continues to live, you have to work through that first, but then you have to experience that truth in your own heart and see your own need for him, and you have to have this conversion of your heart, but then the last one, Martin Luther says, is the conversion of the purse, which means I'm going to give a part of my life back to him, that he owns everything. And for many of us, that means financial contribution, because our money shows where our hope is. It shows where our delight is. It's a sacrifice for financial contribution. For him, it was more like, hey, I'm going to sacrifice my livestock as I have it. And honestly, he didn't have much. What's he going to do? Like give a tenth of a rock? Like he didn't have much at this moment, but he's committing himself to future faithfulness to God's um, purposes. I think for many of us, Giving money is a, is a great step to show that, like, hey, our hearts belong to the Lord and everything we give is an act of worship. But then I want to just give you a little bit of a challenge because for some of us, giving money is easy. You know, it, it takes like five minutes. You just go on the computer and do that type of thing. Um, we can support all kinds of ministries and, and whatnot uh, for the Lord. But giving time, uh, that's more of a sacrifice. What if the Lord owns not just your possessions, but your time, though? And what would it look like for you to potentially tithe of your time? Man, that would be a challenge. Now, for some of us, time is not the issue. And, and we give a lot to the Lord of our time. And just to, just to recognize a few people, the folks that are deacons at this church have tithed their time and more than. Uh, Riley Orell. Uh, why did I say your name like that? I'm sorry. R- Riley Oral, <laughs> Leah Vandenbosch, Michael Villalobos. So thankful for these guys that have 
given of their time. We've got elders here that have given of the same kind of time, Jeremy Cohns and Mark Schmeising. And I think that their examples are, are good for us to, to remember. And the reason why they're doing it is because the Lord owns all of their time. And so they have this commitment to be faithful to the Lord through all things. And many of you have shown that time in and time out. Um, and some of you need to contemplate what do you own, time, skills, money, and how can you give in response to the experience of God that you've had to show that he is your God, that you uh, have owned him fully. We give not out of uh, this religious obligation, though. This is, this is not, we could go into a whole sermon, and I, that sermon should be coming one day. I don't know that I've preached an entire sermon on money at this church, uh, maybe once. And, um, but, but we could talk about the theology of the tithe and what it means for us, and I, I don't believe that a tithe is required, I think, a sacrificial giving in the New Testament. We could talk about that a lot, and that sermon's to come. But the, the reason why we're bringing it up now is because the text brings it up, and also we need to be reminded that the reason why we do this is because the Lord has given us so much. He has given us everything. He has sent his own son, not sparing, sent him to die in my place. And he's been overabundantly generous to us, by giving us this ladder that we might be cared for by God and that we might live in the presence of God, that we might know the meeting place between heaven and earth, which is the man, Jesus Christ, and that we might worship him with all of our hearts. So that's really the first, okay? So if you haven't done that mind conversion, that heart conversion, don't worry about the purse thing, okay? That's for those of us who have worked through the first two. Um, you focus on the first two steps that, that Jacob did. He encountered God and experienced his grace and his kindness and he was led to fear the Lord and enjoy him. And today is not a random day, but today is a day when the Lord is here where he can encounter you and where you can enjoy his grace and be led to fear and to love him more and more. Because the Lord has been so generous with us, though we were his enemies, God sent his own son to die for us. And on the night that this son was betrayed, and he took a loaf of bread and he tore it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. And so he then took a cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so each week we take a communion meal, which is really an invitation to receive the gospel once again. Because as we come forward and we take this meal, we're being reminded that Jesus is the only ladder to God. He is the way that we encounter our living God. We take of the bread and we drink of the, the, the cup and we are reminded that he is the ladder. We're committing ourselves to the gospel. And if you are here today and you've never had that personal experience with God, you've never had that personal, maybe you've been running off the fumes of your parents. Your parents taught you right. They brought you to church. It was the right thing. But today is the day when you need to own Jesus as your Lord, not just their Lord but you own him as your own. And so that's an invitation for you. And if that's you, you haven't done that yet, I'd encourage you to do that. I'd love to pray with you after the service today and uh, invite you to take communion with us next week. We can get you baptized and, and move forward in, in that kind of way. Um, but this is an opportunity to examine our own hearts. Are we following Jesus? Is there, are there things in our life that we need to repent of, church, and that we need to do to make right before we can come to this table. But if you are willing to follow Jesus through anything and you call him your God, we invite you to come to the table. And so church, let's stand as we prepare our hearts to receive this meal uh, from God today. Father, as we come to your table, we pray that there would be those who feel like they're in some random spot. You don't really have a purpose for them. Would you help them to encounter you today? to enjoy your presence, to fear you with that awe and trembling that we read about, that they might delight in the commandments of the Lord, that they might delight in who you are. And God, would we be a people who own you as our own God, who don't just believe in you in a, in a general sense, who don't just have a heart devotion to you, but who have given you our entire life and know that everything belongs to you. So God, I thank you so much for so many people in this church who you see that day in and day out. And God, we pray that you would 
help us to enjoy your grace more so that we would be fueled to give you our lives more. And God, we, we thank you for this meal. We thank you for this moment. We pray that you would meet with us today as we respond to your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.